back in the late 90s. Uh, we had a ton of customers in the dot-com era uh, and even beyond. And in fact, Facebook was one of our customers in 2005 and bought a lot of EAI servers. They quit buying our servers, and then we found out a few years later why with the OCP project. And we'll talk about our, our participation in, these, uh, in the OCP project. So when you look at what we do is we're kind of bifurcated in that we have an HPC kind of focus. We're re really recognized as one of the leading HPC providers in the world. And then we also do a lot of the data center. Uh, in fact, uh, it's kind of interesting. The, the relationship with EPS Global came about because of uh, the DOE customer right there where we did a big uh, OCP deployment. Uh, we used Finisar transceivers. And we actually happened to buy all those transceivers through EPS Global. And then I think about a year later, I saw John at ISC here in Frankfurt. He was saying, oh, pay one. I know you guys from uh, the big project you're doing. Thank you very much for your business. What do you guys really do? And so when I talked about it, I was like, oh, wow, that sounds exciting. We'd like to be able to, to partner with you in some other areas, especially given their global influence and representation in our going to market. And then when you look at uh, J.P. Morgan, I think uh, Stefan at Cumulus had mentioned, so they're using our open switches. So I kind of skipped through it. We do uh, servers, networking, and storage systems. And then uh, probably one of the best ones is the open compute architecture we did at Yahoo Japan. And I'm surprised John didn't bring it up earlier, but uh, uh, Masa Miyamoto-san did a great talk at the OCP Summit last year talking about the real benefits they're getting from OCP both from power infrastructure because they moved a lot of their processing from Japan over to the states, and then also with the maintainability and the, and the, and the reduction in, in staff. <clears throat> I've been up to their data center, and there's only about five or six people that run their entire data center. And we've been deploying both in Japan and in the U.S., and we just recently deployed 100 <coughs> racks of uh, WeWinds to you OCP gear, actually using Edge Core's PK8 management switch, um, and then our own Artica 10D switches. And then I think they had an aggregation switch with Arista. So definitely open systems, and you can see how this all mixes and matches. Um, and there was one other one. And then for our eShelter folks, we actually do a lot of the uh, work with NTT Docomo Innovation Lab in the Silicon Valley. They have one of our big supercomputing clusters. And we actually work, Yahoo Japan is in a um, their own data center in Washington, but they're doing container data centers with HVDC in Japan because they're so energy constrained. It was perfect for them to be able to put OCP gear in, get the energy efficiency for a specific service they were doing for an area. And so we have several brands of our, of our solutions. Our OCP servers are called Tundra. Our open networking systems are called Artica. And we have from GIGI to 100 GIGI switches. I'll talk a little bit more detail about that. I think we're going to partner with EdgeCore on their 10 base T stuff. Um, and then we have our open uh, software defined storage solution called Frostbite, and then Skilled, which is software solutions around HPC. We're located in Fremont, California. We have 50 customers worldwide. Not to forget SolarFlare, but uh, NASDAQ runs on Penguin Computing Servers, and we're using the SolarFlare NIX there as well as Goldman Sachs. In fact, we did both the Roadrunner, the first OCP AMD-based 19-inch uh, OCP server, and their Intel servers for Goldman Sachs, and I think we've deployed probably about five to 10,000 servers there. Uh, we have sales offices in London and Tokyo. Uh, we have worldwide support, so we can support you wherever you're, you've deployed. Stefan had mentioned uh, NagraVision in Switzerland. They've deployed switch, uh, switches in their data center in Switzerland, as well as in their data center in Phoenix, Arizona. And they're doing an I, I think it's an IPTV type deployment, so it's pretty cool stuff. So we really span the, the spectrum of different uh, verticals, from manufacturing. Uh, we do a lot in academics, um, as far as academics and high performance computing. I think somebody from ULIC is here. Uh, we participate every year here in Frankfurt I, at ISC. Uh, we do a lot within oil and gas, multimedia, uh, social media. Um, to talk about OCP and Facebook, uh, and what John had talked about machine learning or GPU systems, we just deployed um, a system for Facebook for their AI platform called FAIR. And if you look at the top 500 list that was published at uh, the ISC in June, it's number 31 on the top 500 list. 
number nine on the uh, on the green 500 list. So Facebook recognized, hey, we're an OCP member. We're really well versed in doing these big systems, and we've actually just deployed a system for them outside the Facebook data center in our data center in, in Salt Lake City. Uh, their second implementation, we're actually managing that entire system for them. So this is, again, what we talk about our solution stack and the wheel. Let me look at our customers. It's HPC from workstations to servers to clusters. And really interestingly is seven years ago, we launched HPC as a service called Penguin Computing On Demand. And some of those earlier uh, reference customers, uh, Oracle Racing uh, designed the last boat they ran in the America's Cup all on Penguin's, uh, Penguin Computing On Demand. Interesting story. Uh, they hired the designer from uh, another company, who, and he had been using Penguin Computing On Demand, uh, used Pod for about a year, and then I think Larry must have found out, Larry Ellison, because we got a call from the guy saying, hey, I, I love your service, but we have a problem. It's on your hardware, not Sun hardware. It's on Oracle hardware. And we said, well, it's, you know, if you love the, the software and the way it works, we'll just port it over and run it. We're not even port it, just run it on Sun Hardware. So I think Sun gave us hardware we put on our data center and actually uh, ran uh, the, the rest of the simulations they did on, uh, on Sun Hardware using our software system. And then we're talking to some F1 teams, so hopefully next year you might see some sponsorship of Penguin Computing and F1 community. And then the Enterprise Data Center, again, it's all about open systems. And then John hit the nail on the head. It's really, most people don't say, hey, I'm gonna change my hardware infrastructure it's somewhat at that data center level, but it's mostly like, I'm going to go to OpenStack. I'm, I'm running big data analytics with Hadoop. I'm looking at software-defined networking or software-defined storage. I'm looking at machine learning and how we do this you know, new predictive analytical environment. And then they say, if I'm doing that, why do I stick with my same infrastructure? Why don't I look at open systems? And then they come to open platforms like what EdgeCore and Penguin provide. And so in our factory, we have the ability to do almost 10,000 units a month, 250 racks. Uh, we're working on actually getting a second location because we have some large telecommunication customers that might push our manufacturing capabilities beyond that. Um, and everything we do is built to order. So you see we have a manufacturing assembly floor, and then we put together the systems and do full system integration tests. So we have about a megawatt and a half to almost two megawatts of power to our facility. Uh, which allows us to also do air and water cooling testing. So we look at Tundra, we're, we're I would call OCP inspired, so this isn't necessarily what Facebook's using internally for their systems, those are being provided by the ODMs like EdgeCore, WeWin, and Quanta. So, but we like that idea, in fact, as I mentioned, Facebook was one of our customers in 2005, and so we said, well, we like what Facebook's doing, but we think we have different use cases for it, which is more high-density HPC-type pro processing. So we designed what we called our Tundra, which is dense, scalable, flexible computing and storage platforms. And so we basically looked at third-party motherboards. So we go source a motherboard from Gigabyte or uh, Intel, which I think is Wistron. And then we put it into a third wide chassis that's only one OU high. So the Facebook uh, compute servers are two OU, ours is a one OU wide. So I have a picture, I didn't bring a server this year. This year, I think if some of you were here last year, you saw I had a server with me. But I have some pictures of it. And so we went through the thermals, uh, all the uh, um, safety and emissions, so it's UL, FCC, and CE certified. And then we also do liquid cooling. As John mentioned, we're looking at these extremely dense systems. How do we dissipate the seed, the heat from those? So we put on uh, direct liquid, uh, direct chip cooling from Asetek to be able to dissipate about 60 to 70% of the heat that's generated by the server, because that's mostly all coming from uh, the CPUs, especially now with Skylake, the TDP on that is extremely high. So right now we have Skylake servers, we have a 1OU server, we do have traditional 2OU servers. Uh, we're excited that AMD's back in the market with Epic, and so we do have a 1OU Epic server coming out and a 2OU Epic server. Um, again, we do PCSD servers from Intel. We're very much involved with Intel's <laughs> RSD, rack scale design uh, group. Um, and we're doing some interesting things with NVIDIA, Tesla, 
both uh, Bolton and Pascal, either PCIe or SXM. So just some details on that, just to give you an idea. I mean, there's no magic here. It's a, it's a two socket x86 server, you know, with some PCIe slots and then you stick a rate card in there, right? So the, the thing is, is that when you talk to your data center guys, a lot of them get freaked out. Like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna support this OCP gear? Reality is, it's, it's the same Intel processor, it's the same LSI controller. There's no differentiation here. It's just making it a lot more efficient through the infrastructure and, and a lot more open. And that's the Intel version. Here's our 2OU version. This you might recognize if any of you have looked at some of the WeWin servers. This is the WeWin 2, 2OU Leopard server. Um, here's that uh, GPU server. So it's a two socket and can support up to four cards. So this is a really interesting solution. We're doing a lot of deployments on for machine learning. So running things like TensorFlow, Cafe, um, we're seeing a lot of interest in this type of uh, processing. Uh, we also have a bootable PI uh, single SOC system. Um, we're doing Power9, so we're partnered with IBM. And this is a design that's come out of Rackspace. Rackspace is very involved in the OCP community. So this is the kind of second generation of the Barrel Ice server to take advantage of NB Link and Power9. And then we also have uh, an ARM server. So if you're looking at ARM as an alternative, this is TX1, and we'll be coming out with a Thunder X2 uh, ARM server uh, when that becomes generally available at the end of the year, beginning of uh, next year. So you can see, again, open systems. So you can kind of look at the racks as, as blade chassis, and then these nodes are different blade servers, but instead of being locked in, you only being able to do an HP server and HP blade, you can use WeWin or Quanta or Penguin, whichever manufacturer that you, that you uh, want. From a storage standpoint, we do Knox Lightning. This is the WeWin JBOD or JBOF. And we also do JBILS Hat Trick or Stacker Velocity, if you know about Hat Trick. So this is a 2OU45 drive. So one of the really cool designs we did was three Tundra sleds driving one of these JBODs, because you could get one sled per JBOD and get a really interesting CPU uh, to, to disk ratio to be able to do some interesting compute kind of profiling if you will. And then from a cooling standpoint, again, we talked about earlier, as I talked about direct to chip, we can use rear door radiators. Um, and I'll talk about our power systems, but you could, in our Tundra design, we could actually get without redundancy 54 kW to a rack. So pretty dense, pretty, some, some pretty kick butt kind of processing to do in that kind of system or traditional in-road chillers. So this is the system from ASICAT. It's, um, again, basically direct chip cooling. It's a radiator hood. It comes in, pumps in cool water, circulates it around the processor, pumps it back out, gets chilled again, so it's that process. Extremely low pressure, so if I went to the plastic tube there, rubber tube, and poked it with a pin, it would basically, it wouldn't squirt out, it would basically just start beating, slowly dripping out. We have sensors in all the servers, so we, we capture, alarm goes off if we, if we see any moisture condensation coming up. So uh, 10 of the big systems we did for the Department of Energy, uh, half of them were this water cooled. And those 10 systems are based, uh, are on the top 500 list in the supercomputing top 500 list. Um, talk just a little bit more about um, liquid cooling. The other interesting byproduct of this is that we only use two fans. With liquid cooling, it's extremely quiet. So when you walk into a data center with this, it's extremely quiet. It's not like buzzing. And because um, most of the heat is generated by the CPUs and it's not getting dissipated out towards the other components, we see a much better MTBF for the RAM, for the controllers, for the PCIe slots, because they're not getting blasted by all that CPU heat. So the other interesting thing, and I think a lot of people have questions on, okay, I understand this, this OCP server, and I need an OCP rack, what does that look like? And right now there's two versions of the rack. Uh, kind of unfortunate, one's version one, one's version two. They're really two different use cases, so it's not like one's the next generation. We designed Tundra for version one, which has three bus bars. Version two has one bus bar. But it's basically what happens, we can take any type of power feed coming in, I'm working with a telco customer, bringing in minus 48 volts, 
the power shelf then takes that and then converts it into 12 volt power and that's what your servers run on. So it's 12 volt bus bar, either single or, or triple bus bar. And then that's again powered by these, uh, by these power shelves. This is an Emerson one, Delta makes one. We work with Murata with the Yahoo Japan guys. And we're actually doing a Rital Bell Power one. So we work very closely with Rital here in Germany and then Bell Power to do uh, the power shell. But this, this is the Emerson one. They're all similar. Each has a rectifier, which is 3KW. What you could do, let me see the next slide. What you could do is, John mentioned you could get rid of UPSs. You could replace one of the rectifiers, put in a battery backup unit, which gives you 90 seconds uh, for your servers, so they could do a uh, you know uninter uninter uninterrupted power supply, or it could also be used for peak. So say you have 15 kW to the rack, your system may go over that threshold. The BBUs could kick in to cover that spike as long as it's within a 90 second time period. And then there's RMUs, which is rack management unit, which again gives you all the diagnostics, so you can do really cool things and look at how your power is being used, and you can do a lot of power budgeting. I want to go back to that. So you can do a lot of power budgeting and say, okay, I want to, I want to boost down. I know, you know, from midnight to 5 p.m., I'm only going to use half of my wrap, my my servers. I'm going to reduce my power workload to get more efficiencies to drive up the PUE in your data center. From a, a storage standpoint, we do a lot of software-defined storage. We are an OEM with Red Hat for both Bluster FS as well as Ceph. I think after DreamHost, we were the second customer to put Ceph into production. Um, DreamHost was kind of the guys that funded Ink Tank, which was Ceph. Um, and then we're doing some HPC stuff with Luster, and then BGFS, which came out of Fraunhofer. Uh, so we're seeing here in Europe a lot of interest in high-performance file systems. And then we're also looking at um, some new file systems like Accelero, which is um, I think the Extreme FS guys, Quobyte. No, I think Quobyte's Extreme FS guys. Then Accelero, which is for Flash. Uh, so some interesting Flash storage options as well. But just for an example, I mentioned uh, Bank of America. They replaced their Isilon system for tick data. It was about half the cost and about three times the performance because they had an old version of Isilon. So maybe not completely a fair comparison, but from what the quotes they got from EMC, we were able to really provide a much more cost-effective solution for them. And then we do have our own uh, Ethernet switches. Uh, you might remember from Finisar, he talked about the ODMs. One was Celestica. So you kind of look like Penguin is to Celestica, a little bit kind of like Edgecore to Acton. So Celestica makes a lot of switches for Juniper, Cisco, et cetera, as well. We brand them. I think the best thing about our switches is we have a yellow bezel, which looks really cool. And then we have, from a management switch, we partnered very closely with Cumulus to run Cumulus RMP on the Arctic of 4804 IP, all the way up to a 100 gig, 32 port switch. And again, their open switches work great with the Finisar transceivers and uh, open cables, whatever cables you want. And so like a lot of people talking about, this is what we're seeing in data centers. Uh, we work very closely with um, uh, an oil and gas company. We're thinking about buying big uh, core switches we put in a really interesting spine leaf architecture for them. So instead of going, I think, with brocade, they ended up with Artica making a very interesting kind of topology like this. So again, a 32, uh, our 3200C is a 32 port with uh, four uplinks. Um, you know, great for an aggregation switch. We have our 25 gig switch, which we're seeing a lot of interest in uh, with the 600 gig uplinks. Uh, our 40 gig switch, a 10 gig, and then a regular uh, gig -E switch. And like, you know, the edge core guys, we're using Helix on our gig -E stuff. I think Hurricane on the IP switch, and then Trident 2, or Trident 2 Plus, and then Tomahawk as well. And lastly, but not least, but uh, what a lot of what we talk about is open systems, and a lot of the vendor, you know, putting together the community. Although we think that's great, what we hear from a lot of the customers, especially the enterprises, I like what you said, but how do I get the support I'm used to from Cisco HP? We have that same global support as well. So we could do 24-7, four-hour, uh, next business day diagnostics, next business day parts, on-site parts depots, 
and everything comes with a three-year standard warranty with advanced parts replacement. And you could do black hole policy on your disk drive. So anything like the guys are like, oh, we only could get HP because they got to do, you know, we get the great service from them. We can provide that same service. And so um, that's it for, for Penguin Computing to kind of give you an introduction of what we're doing, how we're partnering with the various people here, especially with EPS Global. I think we replaced uh, Supermicro over in Ireland. We've worked on many switch opportunities, so they're a great partner. And we could work with them for any questions that you might have.